Welcome. In the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we just, as you can see, are being filmed in the back. Uh, our microphones that we're wearing only project to that. They don't project to you. So if you can't hear us, wave at us or give us a thumbs up or something so that we can make sure that you can hear all of us. And because of that, we're going to wait until the end to ask questions so that we can walk around with one of these handheld mics up here so that we can capture as many of those as possible. So jot them down on your notebook or something so that we can get to those at the end of our presentation. So we're going to do quick introductions and then we'll move right in. So my name is Michelle Ashcraft. I'm the director of Purdue Promise. I've been here just over five years now um, and I'm a Purdue alum as well. And I'm Taylor Brodner. I'm an information system specialist in the Office of Institutional Research Assessment and Effectiveness. And I'm also a Purdue alum and a Purdue Promise alum. Yeah. Okay. My name is Jess Ramsey. I'm an assistant director for Purdue Promise. This is my fourth year with the program. I'm not a Purdue alum, <laughs> um, but I love Purdue. Happy to be here and happy to be here today. Hello. My Hello. It doesn't project. Oh. Hello, my name is Hao Zhu. I work as the es educational uh, assessment specialist for student success. Okay. Uh, so as you may have read from the article or the invitation that you got, we were selected to publish about our program for the National Symposium on Student Retention. And we're gonna be presenting the same presentation in a couple of weeks at Destin. So we'll get away from this dreary weather. Uh, and so this is our opportunity to showcase that on campus as well. So this is what we're gonna chat about today. Uh, we are going to talk about a little bit of the what caused us to create this coaching program and some of the theoretical background that we used to develop our model. We're going to give you a little bit of a history on how we got to today because our program has changed quite a bit over the years and we're connected to a state program called 21st Century Scholars that you may or may not have heard of. We're going to talk a little bit about the demographics of our program, uh, sort of the overarching demographics, and then we'll go into that in a little more detail as well. Uh, we're going to talk about switching from a student leader driven program to a professional coaching program. Uh, for many years in the early stages of our program, we had lots of student leaders in a variety of positions, and now we have uh, completely full time positions that work on our team. We're going to talk about scholarship requirements before and after our coaching model, as those have changed drastically. Uh, Jess and how are going to go extensively into the components of our coaching model. Taylor will talk a little bit about our data and then a couple of new initiatives, and then we'll take your questions as well. Um, so this is uh, the immediate framework that we used when we started thinking about using the coach or developing a coaching model. We have Maslow's hierarchy of needs over here on the left. I'm sure many of you have heard of those. And all of the students that are served by Purdue Promise by nature of being in the program are from a low income background, but also more than half of them are the first in their family to go to college. And so meeting some of these basic needs down here, uh, particularly from a low income perspective, was had to be one of our focuses when we were developing the coaching model. I happened to go to grad school with the program director who designed Appreciative Advising, which is what's on the right. And basically what Appreciative Advising says is regardless of what your background says, if we can develop the right relationships and we can design the right environment and we can offer the right support, any student can succeed on our campus. And so these were kind of the basis for developing our coaching model. We also looked at something called self-authorship theory. Um, and particularly this was really the driving force behind getting to know our students. So when I came to Purdue a little over five and a half years ago, there hadn't really been strong tracking of Purdue Promise students in our program. Nobody could really tell me who's in, who's not, who's on scholarship, who's not. So it took us a little while to get that. Uh, but a common misconception about low income students and those that are first generation as well is that they're not academically prepared to come to school, but also from a grit and resiliency perspective, there's a common misconception that they are the most at risk and need to learn those skills. And it's quite opposite. In fact, many of our students are coming to campus already having those resiliency skills because some of them have helped raise their younger siblings, particularly if a family member or a parent or grandparent has passed away or maybe incarcerated. We have students who are in our program right now who have adopted their younger siblings when they were the first to age out of the foster care system. Many of them have had significant family members with a lot of medical issues and those sorts of things. So they have come to college quite prepared with a lot of life skills that a lot of other college students just don't have. And so this really allowed us to capitalize on those resiliency skills. Um, three years ago, I went and got certified as what's called a Bridges Out of Poverty Lifetime Trainer. Uh, and before this, we were looking into something called the dimensions of wellness. So for my wellness friends in the room, uh, we have some modules that Jess is gonna talk about later that are based on the dimensions of wellness. 
to help make sure that we're holistically supporting our students throughout their time here. And ironically, the dimensions of wellness line up with this very well. So when I went and got trained, I was like, oh, we're on the right track. We're doing the right things. This is nice. But you can see over here, number seven, one of the key resources for helping people get out of poverty is developing relationships. And so that was really a driving force for why we have our student success coach model. This is something that I learned about in my Bridges Out of Poverty training. And if you look at these demographics, those on the left-hand side tend to lead themselves more towards a middle income or higher income background. And those on the right-hand side tend to lend themselves more to those who are in poverty. It's not to say that any one of these characteristics leaves you destined for one of the socioeconomic backgrounds, but trends would say if you have more of those on the left-hand side, you would be more likely to not be in poverty than not. Part of the reason why we show this is when we talk about our demographics, we always talk about low-income, first-generation, underrepresented minority. But within those three big demographics of students that we serve come a lot of other identities. And so our student success coaches have to be highly trained to interact with a very diverse pool of students um, that are in our program and particularly talk about or know how intersecting identities may impact their experience both in poverty and out if we can help them uh, overcome that generational poverty. So we started this coaching program in 2013 and not very long after that the Gallup survey comes out and it was kind of nice for us because again much like Bridges Out of Poverty it kind of gave us a sense of that we're on the right track. And so if you look up here, so these are just some of the quotes that came out of that first Gallup review. But it says things like, if a student had a mentor in college that cared about them, they're more likely to be satisfied if they leave school and go on to be successful in life after college. Um, if they feel like college prepared them for life after college, they feel more uh, holistically well in their life after college um, and those sorts of things as well. If you look at these, it talks about um, that they are more likely to be thriving if they have someone who cared about them or was a mentor and those sorts of things. So again, kind of reinforced that we were on the right track. So for those of you that haven't heard about 21st Century Scholars, it is a state scholarship program the students qualify for in middle school if they qualify for free and reduced lunch. And if they meet certain metrics, like a GPA requirement, um, and they stay out of trouble in high school, then they are guaranteed tuition and fee coverage at any state school that they're accepted to. And so we've just hit over 25 years. Um, and at the 25th anniversary celebration, we were fortunate enough to be awarded with what's called the Champion Award, which means we're the best support program for 21st century scholars in the state. And so that's something that we're really proud of. And so you can see kind of the demographics across the state of all the students that are involved in 21st century scholars. Evan Bayh was governor when this was signed into law. 21st century scholars is actually governed by the Indiana General Assembly, so it is law as a scholarship. Um, and so we do a lot of sort of legislative type things as well. How we got to where we are today, um, we do a little history lesson for our seniors in our GS405 class, and this is one of the slides that we show. So former President Jiski built what was called the Purdue Opportunity Awards Program, and that eventually evolved into Purdue Promise. And part of his legacy was helping create access opportunities for students who may not otherwise be able to afford coming to Purdue. And so there was an application process for one student from all 92 counties in Indiana to be able to come to Purdue. And the challenge was that the scholarship was only for their first year. And so we, while we did a really great job of getting students into Purdue and helping them be successful in that first year, once the money went away, they started to struggle. And so when President Cordova came on, she knew that there was that struggle of not having the four years of financial support, but she also started to look into how 21st century scholars were doing on our campus. And at that time, they were graduating about 10 to 11% behind the university four-year rate. We were far outpacing our peers, um, at other schools across the state, but here they weren't succeeding as high as other students at Purdue. And so she and many of our wonderful colleagues developed what was called the Purdue Promise Program, and we tied it specifically to 21st century scholars, and we set a total family income threshold to qualify. So when I came here, the total family income threshold was 40,000. A few years later, we uh, bumped it to 50,000 for part of the reason to start to catch siblings who are coming into the program who might not have otherwise qualified at that threshold because their family circumstances had changed. Um, so currently under this model, this year we have exactly 1,500 students, and so they all fall under that 50,000 bracket. These are demographics I've mentioned, all low income, but they uh, tend to be far more underrepresented minority and far more first gen than the rest of campus. So you can see some of our um, comparisons there. This is what our current staffing structure looks like. 
Um, so we have two assistant directors that supervise a variety of success coaches. These two at the bottom are highlighted a little differently because we recently partnered with the Summer Start program to provide coaching for those students, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail at the end. You can see our budget down here and what it costs per student. Um, when we built the program years ago, the estimated cost was $578 per student. We've actually dropped that a little bit now, but you can see kind of how our programming and our staffing budget divides out. From a staffing perspective, all of the success coaches on my team have their master's degree in something related to higher education, student affairs, college personnel, those sorts of things. And this is all the training that they go through. Um, we are very fortunate to have a lot of great campus partners across campus who really buy into our program and help support our program. And so we have access to a lot of information about our students. And to have that access, we have to be highly trained to access things over in the registrar system and the bursar system and financial aid system and those sorts of things. Um, and so I always kind of joke, I feel like I could have got an extra degree in like marriage and family counseling and regular counseling and social work and financial planning. I probably wouldn't be fully prepared for everything that walks through our door every day, but we try to do the best that we can to be prepared for what comes through our door. This is what the scholar, how the scholarship works. You'll see that on a financial aid package, if it's listed in this order, which it typically is, we are at the bottom. And that's because we function as what's called a gap scholarship. So we fill in their total financial need that's left over after all other eligible aid is applied to their account. So 21st Century Scholars pays their tuition and fees, and through a combination of federal um, grants, university grants, and Purdue Promise, we cover the rest of their full financial need. Um, so tuition fees, room and board, books, miscellaneous expenses, and transportation fully covered for the students that are in our program. Uh, one of the goals was to help students graduate more on time. The other goal was to hopefully help them graduate debt free. Um, and so this is a debt study that we've been doing recently. Um, we had financial aid make this cool little graphic for us last year. And so you can see um, that we've been doing a pretty good job leading up to the 2015-16 year of even though we have students that are taking on some debt, it's less than what the average Indiana resident takes on um, and less than what the average Purdue resident took on. But just a couple days ago, we got the 2016-17 data, and you can see that it's dropped drastically even just in one year. So something notable about this, the year before, about 14,000, now about 7,000. This represents all four cohorts um, during last school year having all received coaching in our program. So they have all been under the new model, um, and so we project that that will continue to go down. Um, this is how much it used to cost us to have all kinds of student leaders in the department. And so we took a lot of that money and we turned it into full-time success coaches. And it really is what we attribute to moving the needle for our four-year graduation rate. Before having student success coaches, we were doing tutoring, we were doing mentoring, we had all these academic co student coaches, and the four-year graduation rate wasn't moving. And within a year of getting rid of those student leader positions and hiring full-time coaches, we really started moving that needle. Um, so now what we're going to do is talk about our actual coaching model in extensive detail. So Jess and Howe are going to go through the key components of what we do as represented on this infographic and talk about some of the data specifically tied to those pieces. Okay. So like Michelle said, there are a lot of components to our program. Up here you'll see an infographic. It just gives a quick summary and a snapshot of the different pieces that the students have to go through. The great thing about Purdue Promise is it really is, as Michelle mentioned, a four-year holistic program. So we do have that financial support for students, but we also have programming outside of that because money isn't always enough to make sure that students can do well. Um, in addition, we do have a policy, once Purdue Promise, always Purdue Promise. And so even if a student loses their scholarship for some reason, if they're not being funded by us anymore, um, they can actually still meet with their coach. They still have access to the help that our office provides, including for things like appeals, um, financial aid advice, et cetera. So we are really proud of that. Um, on our infographic, you'll see that the requirements, as Michelle mentioned, students do have to be a 21st century scholar. So they have to be an Indiana resident who's completed college with a core 40 degree, a 2.5 high school GPA, and has stayed out of trouble, alcohol-free, crime-free, drug-free, et cetera. Um, so once they're here, they do have to be a full-time, first-time freshman. So we unfortunately do not have capacity at this time for transfer students. Um, a student has to be coming straight here and straight from high school specifically. So they can't have gone somewhere else first or taking gap years. Um, so they do have to come straight here. In terms of the components of our program, I'll go into those in a little bit more detail here in a minute. But just to give you a snapshot, it really does start at the beginning. So we offer them that financial support. 
we offer them some counseling on that financial support, what it means, what's their, you know, what am I agreeing to when I come here and take this money from you? There are strings attached, right? Um, so we really want to make sure that they understand what that is. GS-187 is our first year seminar course. Students have to take this. This is a requirement of our program. For those of you who are new to Purdue, um, there is no required first year experience class for students here, at least not across all of the college. And so we do require all of our Purdue Promise students take that first year seminar course. It's only one credit hour. Um, after that, they do have coaching and modules for all four years that they're in college. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, in addition to free printing, which is pretty awesome. They really like that um, a lot. Uh, and then a capstone course at the end that again, I'll talk about in a few minutes. All right, so this is just to give you an idea of how our program has changed since starting in 2009. So when Michelle talks about before having the student leaders, um, on the left, so that longer list, is the former requirements of the program when it started. And so when Purdue Promise began, there were a lot, lot, lot of requirements. Some of them were academic related. A lot of them were kind of the best practices, like having a student mentor, going to social events, um, it kind of hit us all of a sudden when we were at a skating rink event and there was a student studying for their calc exam on the side of the skating rink, that maybe that wasn't the best use of our time, resources, or energy. And so we really switched the focus to coaching and courses. And so on the right, you'll see what the current Purdue Promise requirements are. We really don't want students to have to jump through a bunch of hoops to keep the scholarship. We really are more of a support program. And so it does start out at STAR as soon as they get here that first day. They're required to meet with a Purdue Promise staff member one-on-one. -on -one. We go through what is the program, what are you getting out of it. We walk them through how their financial aid package works. But we also show them, hey, here are the things we're going to offer you and what you're agreeing to in your four years here. So we make sure they understand that. We do require that they also participate in Boiler Gold Rush, or BGR, our orientation experience. There is a $320 fee associated with that program. Because we do require our students to attend, we actually cover that cost for them automatically. Um, also, we didn't mention this, but there's no application for Purdue Promise. You just get in if you qualify. So talk about really lowering the bar for access. Um, if you qualify, you just get in. That's it. Um, so we really want to make it as easy as we can. So we have that first year seminar course. They have coaching meetings, one of them, during that first fall semester when they have class. Um, from then on, it's two to eight, and I'll talk about how we decide how many in a few minutes. Um, they also have those Blackboard modules, so personal and professional development assignments that they work on throughout the course of the semester. And then at the end, they have that last seminar course. Something new that we do have that we're offering. In the summer of 2016, we piloted a study abroad program um, with Horizons here on campus. We were able to send 10 students on that trip. And last year, or this past summer, I guess, summer 2017, um, we took our own group of 25 students. Michelle led that trip. And the average cost for students out of pocket for that three-week may master course, including their lodgings, their plane ticket, total out of pocket, no one paid more than $500, and that included their deposit. So 500 total. So that's something really nice we're able to offer for our students now. Um, our next trip is leaving this May, and I get to go this time, so it's exciting. As far as GS-197 curriculum, so again, GS-197 is our first year seminar course, once a week. Not a huge time commitment for students, but it should be one of the easiest classes you ever take at Purdue, but one of the most useful. And so we really want to focus on what are the skills you need to have and the knowledge you need to have in order to be as successful as possible in your first year here. Um, and in a minute, Hal will show the correlations between first year performance in this class. But just to give you an idea of what we offer in that, it's really focusing on goal setting. How, are, how am I going to plan this semester? How am I going to follow through on those plans for this semester? We really focus a lot on time management, technology literacy. How do I use Blackboard? How do I make sure my assignment actually got submitted to Blackboard? All of those fun things. Um, something we're really proud of that we instituted last year in fall 2016, um, we started offering QPR training, or suicide prevention training, to all of our incoming students during this course. So we started that last year. This year, we actually had all of our coaches, all of our staff trained as QPR certified instructors. And so every single freshman moving forward in Purdue Promise will have at least some suicide prevention training. 
So we're really excited about that. I always advertise it to students as something that could benefit them down the road for a friend, a family member, a classmate. They could put it on their resume. It's really nice. Um, among some other topics. So you'll see those up there. Another one we're really proud of is we do spend two weeks focusing on identities. For a lot of our students, they're coming from, compared to the university average, a pretty diverse background. But at the same time, some of them have never left Indiana. And so we really focus on them exploring their own identity and how that fits in with you know, everyone on campus. So we do have a couple assignments, not very many. We try to keep those to a minimum as well. But the one we get most excited about is really the Who I Am paper. The Who I Am paper is a free form writing assignment. They get two pages to tell us whatever they want. And I'm always amazed every year at how many students are very, very brutally honest in that and willing to share things you would never expect, which really helps inform that first coaching meeting they have as a freshman. Between that and their semester plan where they have to set goals and look up their instructor's office hours and they have to know what the grading scale is in their class, it makes for a pretty good first meeting at the very beginning of that first semester. So now Hal's going to talk to you a little bit about the data for our class. So this is a quick slide about uh, the data on GS197. From the chart on the left, we can see that there's a positive relationship between GS197 grade and first year GPA. So a higher GS197 grade is correlated with a higher first year um, GPA. Um, so uh, GS197 is heavily attendance-based, and, and this has, a, a, in GS197, the coaches take a proactive training uh, and teaching method. Uh, bridges out of poverty, which was shown in, which was shown in previous slides, tells us that students may fear disappointing others. And so they don't want to face their coach and disappoint them. So a lot of time, a lot of, uh, oftentimes they don't show up in classes because uh, they're not performing very well. And so uh, the coaches would reach out to them and ask them, um, is everything okay? How can I help? Uh, then they follow up on the missing assignments and they'll say, well, I missed you in class today. Uh, is everything okay? I want to show my support. They also follow up on the uh, attendance issues. And so if this happens two to three times in a row, then the coaches are uh, likely to give them a, a deadline to respond or they'll file a student and concern report and request a wellness check. Okay, so as promised, the first thing that students have to worry about is that GS197 seminar. Um, after that, we do color code our students to decide how many coaching meetings we think they need to have. These are the 12 factors that we look at when we determine a student's standing. We do code them red, yellow, or green, and then we assign meetings based on that. So most commonly, we do look at GPA factors, so cumulative GPA, semester GPA. We also look at academic standing, so should you be a junior but you only have sophomore credits? Are you a pre-com major who's a junior? Things like that that don't quite seem right. And so those are the factors we primarily look at to determine whether or not a student is red, yellow, or green. Um, once we have kind of looked through those factors, processed that, you know, are you on scholarship, are you off scholarship, are you on academic probation or not? Um, once we've really looked at that, we do code the students and then assign them a certain number of meetings based on that code. And so generally with freshmen, that very first semester, they do have one meeting outside of their freshman seminar course. The meeting is actually a requirement of the course. It's part of their grade. So we have pretty good attendance on those. Um, after that, some of the students, based on their semester plan update, if we notice right around midterms that they're struggling with classes, maybe they have one or more grades below a C, oftentimes their coach will ask them to meet again, and they do. Um, for the most part, they have the one meeting their freshman year in the fall. After that, they generally have between two and four. If they're green, so in good shape, they have a solid GPA, they're in, you know, on paper, everything looks okay. Um, generally, those students have two meetings if they're green. Um, if there's some factor that's kind of in the middle, we generally classify them as yellow. So that would be anything between a 2.5 cumulative and probation. So somewhere around there. So we meet with yellow students usually around at least three times per semester. If a student is classified red, they usually meet anywhere between four and eight times per semester. Again, kind of depending on their situation, how long they've been on probation, how low their cumulative GPA is. 
And those meetings are very free form. The idea is really to meet the students where they are and address any needs and questions and concerns that they have. And so for a green student, maybe you're talking about roommate conflicts, maybe you're talking about planning for graduate school. Sometimes for a red student, maybe this happened today, I don't know, um, it's attendance issues or talking about the benefits of attending a class even if the professor says that it's optional to attend the class. So those are just some things we think about. As of now, seniors generally are not required to have meetings. They are required to have that capstone course in the fall. But if they're on probation at this point, because they're still on scholarship, we do mandate that students on probation who are seniors do meet with us. And so we have a couple of those. We really want to help them graduate, again, on time and debt free if possible. And sometimes something messes you up in the fall of your senior year that can set you behind. And so if you're already on probation, we do require that you meet with us. Um, outside of that, it's optional. We have some super seniors who'll come in, and that's wonderful. And we have some students who aren't on scholarship anymore that will still decide to come in to try to regain their funding later, which is amazing. So we do see them pretty frequently. Um, as far as the modules, I mentioned those. The idea of the modules is really if we get to see you between two and eight times per semester, how can we make sure you're still connecting and making positive momentum forward, not just in classes, but also in your personal and professional development when you're not in those meetings? And so the modules were really developed to help fill that gap in, hey, if I don't get to see you for another six weeks, here's something you can be doing in the meantime that I'm going to follow up on. And so they've kind of been adapted over time. The original pilot was very focused on a cohort model. So you are a sophomore, you need to go to an internship fair. Um, so very structured, very prescriptive. Um, we switched over for the 14, 15, 15, or 16, 17 ish around that range years. Um, we switched to something that was a lot more free form. Students got to choose what they wanted based on their needs. There were kind of pros and cons to both. What we heard most frequently, there were a lot of seniors who said, I wish I would have had to do this one assignment. I didn't because it took a little longer, but I wish someone would have made me do it because it's really important, like checking your credit score. Sometimes by the time you're a senior and you check it, it's a little late. And so um, really what we've tried to do this year is restructure these a little bit so that they're kind of a mixture. They get a choice, they get some, some choices in terms of what do you want to do, what makes sense for you right now, but there are some that are more prescriptive, like making sure your resume is updated by the end of your junior year, which is important for everyone. So, all right, so how is going to go over the data on the modules as well? All right, here's more data. Um, the chart on the left, we can see that there's still a positive relationship between the completion rate of the modules and first year um, GPA. Um, it's slightly weak, but it's still positive. Um, and students normally start taking their modules in the f uh, spring semester of their freshman year and finish them until the end of their junior year before taking GS 405. Uh, in fall 2013, my colleagues and I wrote a briefing on Purdue Promise. In the analysis, we found that there is a positive relationship between 100% uh, meeting attendance and module completion rate and first year GPA. After first year of coaching, however, in the fall semester, the meeting completion and module completion have statistically significant co correlations to higher GPAs for sophomores and juniors. In the spring semester, however, both meeting completion and module completion have significant correlations to higher GPAs for all cohorts. Okay. And then after they've done the first year seminar, They've done the coaching, they've done the modules. Um, fall of their senior year is when they have our senior seminar capstone course. And so with this class, they jokingly call it Adulting 101. Um, we call it Life After College. So if the idea of a first year seminar is to prepare you for college, the idea of this one is to prepare you for everything that comes after, which I think a lot of us can agree, we might not have been ready for when we left college. Um, when I defer, like, pick my first ever insurance plan, it was like reading something in Latin. I had no idea what it was. And so really our goal in this class, and it's the only class like this offered at Purdue that we know of, students really love it. Outside of coaching, this is by far the thing that students like the most. They rave about this class. They tell us about, I went home and told my mom about what you told me about this or that. Um, it's really, really cool and really powerful to see that happen. 
And so it's really focused on how do you prepare yourself to be a successful adult after college. We're really lucky in that some of our seniors have already accepted jobs at this point, which is wonderful. But most of this is really relevant, whether they're planning to do, like, go straight into the workforce, or they're planning on going to graduate school, or take a gap year and then go to graduate school, or maybe they're going to stay here a little longer. It's still really helpful. And so we really focus on negotiating job offers, understanding what are benefits, what kinds of insurance should you make sure you have, what's really important, the basics that maybe no one ever tells you. And so students love the class. Um, what we really love about it is a lot of the assignments are short, but they're very practical. So again, students say, I wish I would have done a lot of these things sooner. And so I guess better late than never, right? And so this is a one credit hour seminar. Generally, the GS197 class is taught by the student's coach. So whoever their coach is is their instructor. Um, GS405 is taught by Michelle, the director, and then the assistant directors. So I'm teaching a couple sections of this this year. And it's a lot of fun. It's really cool to see the seniors grow from the time they were freshmen to when they're seniors. And they have a lot of great questions. A lot of them will come in when they do get job offers and say, hey, I know you're not an expert, but can you look over this with me real quick? And that's a really cool, really powerful thing. Okay. And then the other thing that um, we'll touch on here is the GS405 information. All right. This slide shows the assessment information of GS405. Um, the, the assessment data are collected in the pre and post survey, distributed at the beginning and at the end of the semester. So the pre and post surveys ask students to self-report on their comfort and confidence levels in these main categories. Skills related to negotiation and understanding benefits, managing finances, and workplace knowledge. Paired sample analysis of four years of data, as we can see in the bar charts, show that there are statistically significant changes in the mean uh, between pre and post survey. Um, this actually indicates that Purdue Promise, uh, per Purdue Promise GS405 has been effective in helping students raise their confidence and comfort levels in uh, those content areas. And now we can see that there are negative changes in those bar charts. This is actually because the questions were framed in a way where one indicate one uh, indicates uh, extremely comf uh, comfortable and confident whereas four indicates extremely unconfident and uncomfortable. So a negative changes in the mean between pre and post actually suggests that students are moving towards a lesser number, which indicates a higher level of confidence and comfort. Okay. And then the last thing that I'll talk about is the appeals processes that we do help students through in our program. And so because our students are on a state scholarship, being 21st century scholars, and also an institutional scholarship, Purdue Promise, sometimes stuff happens and they lose those. And as Michelle mentioned, the hard thing about a scholarship program like that is when students lose the money, sometimes we lose the students. And so our goal is really to do whatever we can to help them keep their funding if possible. So we do help them through a series of different appeals processes. The most common we help with is the financial aid satisfactory academic progress appeal. For those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with that policy, um, with financial aid at Purdue, students need to be passing at least 67% of the courses that they attempt here on campus or at any Purdue campus. If students aren't meeting that 67% completion mark, whether it's due to failed courses, retakes, withdrawn courses, then they technically can't qualify for any financial aid, federal, state, institutional. So no loans, nothing. And so what's hard about that is even if you've met the requirements for 21st century scholars for Purdue Promise, if you don't meet pace for satisfactory academic progress, you don't get aid. And so that's when we primarily help students through with the Division of Financial Aid here on campus. So we help them with that process. A lot of you are advisors in the room and you probably help fill out those forms and help them with that process as well. The other process we help with a lot is a state appeal. So if for some reason the student does lose their 21st century scholarship and they have an extenuating circumstance like a death in the family, family illness, personal illness, military service, we do help them through that state appeal process with the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. We also help with merit appeal processes. So if for some reason a student loses Purdue Promise, the most common reason for losing Purdue Promise would be for taking time away because Purdue Promise does require continuous full-time enrollment. 
So if a student were to, let's say, take a semester off for health reasons, we would help them to appeal to financial aid to get that merit scholarship back. So those are the ones we help with the most. The great thing is when we help students, they have significantly higher chances of having their appeal approved. And so we've been very lucky that with our students, right now we're sitting at about an 86% approval rate on our SAP appeals. So again, to get financial aid period, we're sitting right around a 74% merit appeal approval. So getting their Purdue Promise funding back and then 64% for the state. It is a little bit harder to get the state appeals approved because that is written into the law. If a student doesn't meet their requirements and doesn't meet the extenuating circumstances, that's a little bit trickier. And so we do our best to help them through those processes as well. Um, if a student loses 21st Century Scholars, Purdue Promise can't fill in the gap for that. We can fill in the gap for almost anything else, but not their 21st Century Scholars loss. So we really do try to help get that back in whatever way we can. Most commonly, if you're curious, students lose that because they aren't meeting credit completion requirements. The state requires that students finish 30 credit hours per year or past 30 credit hours per year, including summer. So if a student doesn't meet that, they would need to appeal unless they have some credit banked up. So those are the basics. We really wanna help them through those processes. Um, and it's something that's really important to us. And we've seen really dramatic increases in the number approved since we began helping students with that process. So I'm gonna turn it over to Taylor to talk about all the fun assessment. So Purdue Promise staff and coaches regularly track 51 issues and problems that are related to students' ability to graduate on time. The biggest, one of the biggest factors that have contributed to the success of the current Purdue Promise model is our student success database, which is where all of the Purdue Promise staff track all of their contacts that they have with their students. So the staff is able to show that the students are responding positively to all of this coaching because they're able to track how many times the students are coming in to see them and how many emails they're sending back and forth, their phone calls and all of that. And through the database and all of this tracking of all of the contacts that they have with their students, they've been able to make this list of 51 issues and concerns that affect the student's ability to graduate on time. And while the staff actually found this list through just their personal interactions with the students, they actually soon realized that most of these problems on this list are actually already listed as checkboxes for extenuating circumstances for merit and state appeals, which Purdue Promise helps with that Jess talked about in the last slide. The next few slides are going to look at notable changes in the Purdue Promise retention and graduation rates over the past few years. We'll look at a comparison of all Purdue Promise students to 21st century scholar students who are not in Purdue Promise, and then Pell eligible students who are not served by Purdue Promise or 21st century scholars. And then it also includes the rates for Indiana residents and all Purdue students. And when you're looking at these charts, you'll wanna note that the fall 2013 cohort was the first cohort to receive personalized professional coaching for all four years. They were also the first cohort for the implementation of the 306090 credit completion policy and also the total family income increase for the program requirement from $40,000 to $50,000 happened in fall 2013. Additionally, Purdue had a new academic probation policy that they implemented in spring 2016. So that actually led to more students being dropped in their first year for the 2015 and 2016 cohorts. So we'll start out with first year retention rates. You can see here that the 21st century scholars who are served by Purdue Promise almost always beat the one year retention rate of 21st century scholars who are not served by Purdue Promise. And in the years where that wasn't the case, those were years where our scholar core program here on campus was actually really strong. This chart shows the two year retention rates. Again, you can see that in most years, the 21st century scholars in Purdue Promise outperformed the other 21st century scholars that are not served by Purdue Promise. You can see that before 2012 and before coaching, the two-year retention rate was actually dropping. And then when they started implementing coaching in 2012 and 2013, you can see that rate starting to rise again. This three-year retention chart shows where fall, where coaching started in fall 2012 and then where the fall 2013 cohort actually received all four years of coaching. So you can see that prior to coaching, 
The 21st century scholar students who were not served by Purdue Promise were actually starting to greatly surpass the students who were served by Purdue Promise. And then when coaching was implemented in 2013 and 2014, you can see that the three-year retention rates for Purdue Promise students were actually higher than the students who were not served by Purdue Promise and also the Pell eligible students who weren't served by Purdue Promise or 21st century scholars. This last chart shows the four-year graduation rates. Purdue Promise was actually started so that they could help close the gap for 21st century scholars in their four-year graduation rates. Since Purdue Promise was started in 2009, the four-year graduation rate for their students has increased by 18%. You can see that besides 2010, the 2012 and 2013 cohorts were the first ones where the Purdue Promise students' four-year graduation rates actually surpassed the 21st century scholar only and Pell eligible only students. And in 2010, that also happened there likely because the juniors in that cohort received pilot coaching because the Purdue Promise staff realized that a lot of students were dropping out in their summer between junior and senior year. So they piloted coaching that year and that's why they think that those students performed that well. And then in 2011, you don't see that result because those students did not receive any coaching. The biggest thing to note here is the gap between the Purdue Promise four-year graduation rate and the university rate. When the program started in 2009, there was a over 9% gap between the two rates, and now the 2013 cohort actually had a less than 3% rate gap between their graduation four-year graduation rate and Purdue's four-year graduation rate. Since Purdue Promise started in 2009, the Pell eligible students in Purdue Promise have outperformed all other Pell eligible students at Purdue in their one year and two year graduation rates, despite them coming from the lowest, some of the lowest family incomes in all of Purdue. You can also see that the Pell eligible students in Purdue Promise outperformed the four year graduation rate of other Pell eligible students for more than half of the cohorts. Similar results can be seen for underrepresented minority or URM students that are in Purdue Promise. For the one year retention rate, all URM students in Purdue Promise outperformed all other URM students for all cohorts. And the two year retention rate, they outperformed all other URM students for all co cohorts except for one. And then for the four year graduation rate, they outperformed all other URM students in almost half of the cohorts and they outperformed all other URM students for the six-year graduation rate in more than half of the cohorts. Purdue started tracking first-generation students in 2011, so since 2011, similar to the other results, you can see that the first-generation students in Purdue Promise have outperformed their first-generation peers who are not served by Purdue Promise in all cohorts for first-year retention except for one, and then they either met or succeeded the two-year retention for first-generation students. And there are still gains to be had for graduation, four-year and six-year graduation. In fall 2013, the Indiana Commission for Higher Education implemented the 30-60-90 credit completion policy. So they put out a 2015 press release where they showed that Purdue was beating all other institutions all other Indiana public institutions in the categories for enrollment and completion, and they received second place for the fourth category. In November 2015, as Michelle mentioned before, Purdue Promise was awarded by ITCHE for the Champion Award, which rewarded their outstanding impact and contribution to the 21st Century Scholar Program. This data is also from ITCHE, and it showed that 21st century scholars at Purdue West Lafayette outperformed all other Indiana public universities in the categories of college performance, retention, and completion. And then they also matched four other universities with 100% college readiness, a college, college readiness rate. So the top chart here is recreated from the 2016 21st century scholar scorecard for the 2015-16 school year, and the bottom table is recreated from the 2017 21st Century Scholar Scorecard for the 16-17 school year. And you'll want to notice here the difference between the performance for 21st Century Scholars in the all Indiana public colleges rates and the Purdue rates. 
The Purdue rates far outspace all the all public colleges for every category. And now Michelle will talk about the future of the Purdue Promise program. Okay. All right, so two last things to wrap up with. So as Jess mentioned, we started a study abroad program uh, this past year. We piloted it with Horizons a couple of years ago. So these are the students that went with us on this trip this past summer. We wanted to start this since Purdue Promise began. It's been a struggle trying to figure out how to effectively do it because since the students in our program, the majority of them are fully funded, if we gave any additional funding directly to the students to support their ability to study abroad, it would be considered income because it's over their total financial aid um, eligibility. And so then they would have to be paying taxes on the money that we're giving them to study abroad and that just didn't really ever make sense. Um, and so when Horizons moved into our department, they had had a study abroad program for several years and were working directly with the study abroad department to execute that program. And so we found out there was a way where we could transfer money to the study abroad office and pay the company that we work with to coordinate the program directly rather than giving money straight to the students to help supplement that cost. Um, so we took 20 students to Spain for three weeks this past year. They got to see four different cities during that time there. We flew into Madrid and spent a couple of days there and then spent a night in Toledo. The bulk of the trip was spent in Valencia where they had a homestay experience and then we had an off weekend in Barcelona. So quite the little Spain tour. One of the goals that we really had was not only increasing access to study abroad for low income students, but making sure that the students that we selected for the trip really mirrored the population within Purdue Promise, but also hopefully exceeded the rates uh, for first generation and underrepresented minority students studying abroad at Purdue. And so actually the students that we took with us were more uh, URM and more first gen than even the Purdue Promise population, let alone the rest of the Purdue population. So we considered that a really great success for our program. And so we'll be replicating this program in the upcoming year. We're sending 20 more students and three staff members back to Spain um, to do this experience. And it was awesome. Many of, the, many of the students who went on the trip not only had never been out of the country, they had never been out of Indiana. And there were some of them that the only time they had ever been out of their home county was when they come to school for Purdue. And so talk about a life-changing experience when you, most of them it was their first time on a plane. So we're doing these pre-departure meetings and we're talking about like, how do you go through airport security and what sort of luggage do you need to pack and how do you get a passport and those sorts of things. So a great life learning experience for those students that got to go on the trip with us. Do you have a clicker? Thank you. Um, so then I mentioned earlier that we are also, we have two brand new success coaches that we just hired this year that are working with the Summer Start program. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Summer Start program, in summer 2016, the university decided to pilot a conditional admit program uh, to allow 150 students we happen to get 180 to enroll into the program who would otherwise be denied fall admission, but maybe had some extenuating circumstance that caused them to be denied admission. So you're talking about students that may have really high test scores and really high GPAs, but maybe their high schools didn't offer dual credit and AP credit, so they don't seem as competitive. Or maybe they had gobs of credit and really high test scores, but something happened at the end of their junior year in high school and their GPA tanked. We were talking about students who had cancer or lost loved ones, um, had major accidents, those sorts of things. And so the university decided to give some of those students a shot, bring them in early for a five-week summer session where they take seven credits um, and receive some extra support to hopefully help them prepare to be successful during their time here at Purdue. Um, if you're familiar with the at-risk algorithm, uh, our colleagues over in OIRE have developed this algorithm that predicts students who are likely to get a 2.5 or below in their first semester. And in the summer start population, as in the Purdue Promise population, you see tremendously more students who are on that at-risk list. What's been interesting about Purdue Promise is in spite of that predicted at-risk nature, their participation in Purdue Promise more often than not causes them to outperform that prediction. And then when you couple their participation in Purdue Promise with study abroad, learning communities, um, supplemental instruction, those sorts of things, uh, they outperform it at even higher rates. And so when the conversation started about summer start students, many of the colleagues involved in those conversations decided if we're going to bring these students here and give them a shot at being at Purdue, we need to offer support for them. Um, and so we were selected as the program to offer that support. So last year for the pilot year, we had a graduate student who worked with the students um, who were uh, involved in that first cohort and did coaching meetings with them. 
in order for them to get a scholarship towards the fall semester, they had to complete some things over the summer, um, including two coaching meetings. And then in order to get a scholarship towards spring, they had to do two minimum as well. Unlike Purdue Promise, we don't have continued scholarship support for summer start students. So they have the ability to get a scholarship, a minimal one at that, $500 a semester for their first year. But then after that, there's no little carrot to dangle over them like we do with Purdue Promise. And so part of the reason for us participating in summer start is to help support those students. But part of it is also a unique pilot situation where is it possible that we could develop relationships enough with students that they would continue to come in and receive support even if there's not a carrot for it. And so Jess mentioned earlier that we have a lot of students in Purdue Promise who aren't on scholarship, but they still come in and see us. Or we have fifth year seniors or sixth year seniors who still come in and see us. And that has been the case. We started tracking optional meetings. So we have our required meetings for our students, but now we track optional meetings too. And particularly with freshmen, once we have that first meeting within that first semester, they want to meet with us all the time. Um, and so really, I think the next step in us looking at what makes Purdue Promise work is really kind of studying what it is that our staff does, and that's really complicated, and I'm going to let Taylor's team kind of figure that out in the future. Um, but I think what's really telling is we do a senior survey um, for our students, and one of the questions on that senior survey says, what was the resource that Purdue Promise offered to you that made the most difference in your success? And for five years in a row of that senior survey now, 100% of students have either wrote the name or names of their coaches or wrote the word coaching, um, including after that first pilot year. And so we really believe that the relationship with the coach is what makes the difference. And so our hope in piloting this program with Summer Start is if we can get students really engaged in developing a relationship with a coach, maybe we don't have to give them a whole bunch of scholarship money to keep engaging in that support. Um, and hopefully we can help them be successful here at Purdue. Um, so with that, we've got some time that we'd be welcome to take any questions that you have. We have some mics that we can come around so that we can catch them um, on the video in case others want to uh, watch the presentation afterwards. So we'll come around with mics and my guess is I'll probably answer the majority of them. So I'll have you all um, go around with the mics. Hi, I'm a little confused about the, the conditional start because some of those kids would obviously be 21st century okay. scholars, but do they, are they not eligible for the scholarship then? Yes. So we, in the first cohort, are, we projected for 150 students and we got 180. We tried for 150 again this last year and we got just shy of that. And in the first cohort, there were 33 who overlapped with Purdue Promise and an extra 11 that were 21st century scholars not in Purdue Promise. And this year, there's 24 that overlap with Purdue Promise and an extra seven that are 21st century scholars not in Purdue Promise. Those that overlap with Purdue Promise, they get all the same support of Purdue Promise. And so that has actually given us even more data to show that Purdue Promise is really impactful because if you think about Purdue Promise from an income perspective, they're the lowest of the low income at Purdue. And because income status goes into the at-risk algorithm along with first generation status and those sorts of things, many of them are predicted at risk but participation in Purdue Promise is helping them outperform that prediction. Well, then if you think about being a Purdue Promise student in summer start, now you're even more at risk. You didn't even get admitted to begin with. And yet those students, the ones who participate in summer start, some of them are outperforming even the regular Purdue Promise students. And they're definitely outperforming the other summer start students because they kind of have to come in and get more support in order to get the Purdue Promise scholarship. Um, we did, we only obviously have one year of data, but we did see some correlation between um, first year GPAs for summer start students and those who did the coaching meetings and those who didn't. Um, and so we're hoping that we'll see the same trend moving forward as we take on more summer start cohorts. Of the 21st century scholars at Purdue, what percentage are served by Purdue Promise? Great question. So when our total family income requirement was 40,000, we served about half of the 21st century scholars that come to Purdue. When we bumped it to 50,000, now we serve about two thirds of them. Um, an interesting kind of change in legislation for 21st century scholars is, so Purdue promised we never look at your total family income once you enroll. So that 50,000 cutoff now, it's just at the time of enrollment and then we don't look at it again. Similarly for 21st century scholars, their income was never looked at once they enrolled in middle school. And now because there's so many students in the pipeline, they're doing something called financial means testing, where at the end of high school, they look at students um, 
FAFSA information to determine should they still qualify for 21st century or not. So they either get the commitment for four years of support or they get a one-time $2,500 award. Um, and so we could probably catch the majority of them at a 65 to 70 total family income range. Um, the challenge for some of those students is they're gonna get very little from us. Um, and so there's talks always about do we raise it again and at what point do we serve them all? But we also know that if we raise it, those students on the higher end of that spectrum aren't gonna get as much money from Purdue Promise. And so I think this summer start pilot could be good justification for that. If we can get students to engage in coaching for little to no money, maybe that gives us some ammunition for increasing the total family income to serve all 21st century scholars too. Other questions? You mentioned self-authorship. Uh, who are your key academic theorists for, for that? For self-authorship? So I had a, a step, former staff member who went to the school where Baxter Magolda does her research, which is why we have that in there. Um, we, now that I have done Bridges Out of Poverty, the most of the research that we base on are things that come out of Bridges Out of Poverty. Um, that's really kind of the driving force behind the coaching that we do. Um, a lot of that is tied into diversity work, and so there's a lot of diversity theories that we look at now for overlapping identities. Um, but really we look at, you know, there's a lot of things that we look at for grit. There's a lot of things that we look at for growth mindset. Um, all of those kind of buzzwords, I guess, that are in student affairs now. We look at all of those things, but really I think it's individually and holistically supporting students, and there's no one theory or no one policy or no one model that is going to fit every student individually, which I think is why student success coaching works so well. Um, it's hard because we are one of the only programs like us out there. There's a lot of students that are a lot of schools that are trying to do what we do now, but you go and you look into research and there's academic coaching research and there's career coaching research and there's, you know, all sorts of other kinds of research, but there's not really much that's done on student success coaching research, um, which is why we try to get out there and present as much as we can. But we really try to customize things as much as we can and, and really help the students try to drive their stories. Thanks. In Taylor's numbers, yes. uh, the URMs and the first gens, Purdue Promise did great in years one and two, mm -hmm. did less well in years four, six, whatever. Yep. Do you imagine that your new coaching strategy is gonna help farther down the line? Yes, absolutely. So um, that, not just for first-gen students and not just for your end, but for Purdue Promise students in general, we've seen that case. So really strong success in years one and two. Um, it's interesting, when you look nationally, if you're gonna lose somebody in college, you tend to lose them after their first year. If not, you tend to lose them after their second year. But a lot of research nationally will show if you get them to third year, they're gonna be pretty likely to graduate. That's not the case for Purdue Promise students. We have our highest attrition in the summer between their junior and their senior year. And we see this for a few key reasons. Um, one is we have a lot of students that come in as pre-pharmacy students because they figure if Purdue Promise is gonna front the bill for the first four years, at least I can get a pharmacy degree for a lot cheaper than I would otherwise. Um, but not everyone makes it into pharmacy school and so then what do you do after that? And so we've had some strategic partnerships with some of the other colleges across campus of how do we get those students into something to still help them graduate. Um, we have a lot of students who wanna try to get into nursing and when they don't, for some reason, the next most viable path for a lot of those students is they wanna do dental hygienist or dental assisting and we don't have those programs here. So we lose a lot to IUPUI because they have great support programs for 21st century scholars. Many of our students are from Indianapolis so they go to study dental things. Um, we also lose a lot of students who are from our College of Ag for the reason that many of them, once they graduate from Purdue, they are going to go home and work on their family farms. And so when it starts to get really hard in their junior year, they think, well, why do I need this degree? I'm just gonna go home and work on my family farm. And so we lose some of them at the end because of that. Those are kind of the three really big buckets that we see. Um, but I think the coaching is helping. We saw just with the pilot, when we started the pilot, we intentionally did it with juniors to try to make a difference for that cohort, and we did. Um, we project graduation rates, um, and we always fall historically about 10% behind what we project. 
for lots of different reasons. Um, so just to give you a little like glimpse into our world, three weeks ago in the same week, we, I, uh, we had 15 students in our program that were actively suicidal, seven of them within a 24 hour period that we were dealing with. And I called the Department of Child Services four times that week for things that were going on with younger siblings at home. Um, and that's just like a normal week for us. Um, my, I think if you read the article that was in Purdue today, you know, I had a week where I had 34 students lose parents in the same week, 11 of them were in the same day. So we get a lot of students the senior year and then tragic things happen, car accidents and family deaths and all sorts of things. So we usually, pretty on par almost every year, end up about 10% behind what we project. This year's cohort, the 2014 cohort, first to receive what is our current stable model all four years, first to have credit completion requirements by the state all four years, um, first under the new academic probation policy, um, and there's some other kind of FAFSA things that are new for them, um, and they are projecting at 74% right now. So the university rate right now is just over 55% for four year. So my hope is even if we fall 10% behind, maybe we still beat it, and who knows? Like, they, they all swear, you know, Justin and I are teaching GS 405, and they swear, 74% of them, that they're on track to graduate this year, and we'll see where we stand. Um, but they're definitely projecting much higher than any cohort before them. Okay. All right, well, if that's it, I thank you so much for coming. Um, whatever it is that your background is, I know several of the faces in the room, but um, I thank you for being interested in our program and coming out and spending time with us today. We'll stay up here for a little bit if you have individual questions you don't want to ask in front of the group, but otherwise have a good rest of the day.